this uh, eight year old gentleman with this brown very dense cataract well, let's understand and discuss few issues which we face while managing a such nucleus these are the few of the expected challenges while managing such a rock hard nucleus difficulty in dividing the nucleus potential damage to the endothelium higher chances of capsulozonular complications and possibility of wound burns we need to understand that apart from being a very hard and dense nucleus it also is a bulky nucleus occupying almost the entire bag so few precautions are to be taken Number one would be adequately sized rexis. This is very critical as a larger rexis makes it easier for us to manipulate the nucleus, putting less stress on the capsule and the zonules. The rexis here is around 5 mm, but I would like it to be slightly bigger, maybe 5.5 mm. Nevertheless, we need to continue and let's see how things fare. Number two would be during hydrodissection, we need to be extremely careful in using very limited amount of fluid to do hydrodissection to prevent posterior capsular blowout as some of these cases have got very thin posterior capsule. The free nucleus rotation confirms the lack of any corticocapsular adhesions. Since this is a hard nucleus, I need to get a very good grip on the central deeper part of the nucleus for successful chopping. To get access to the deeper part of the core nucleus, I am creating a small central pit so that I can bury my tip deep into the central core of the nucleus, which will help me in cracking the posterior plate more efficiently. Please note that my assistant is constantly pouring cold BSS over the incision site to minimize the chance of wound burns. I am burying the tip deep into the nucleus and creating my first crack using a vertical chop technique. The crack is initiated but I am unable to achieve the first crack through and through. So I am going to rebury my phaco tip once again and trying to laterally separate. I can see that the posterior plate is still not completely separated. I am unable to place my second instrument deep enough and this is the reason why which is preventing the posterior plate from cracking. So no problem, just rotate the nucleus and then I continue to chop. The chopping and lateral separation is being done at progressively deeper planes and the posterior plate is quite tough and eventually with sustained effort uh, the posterior plate get separated but still some part of it is attached. I continue to chop vertically the first heminucleus and you can see that when during lateral separation my sometimes I am stretching the rexus margin. So this is something which I need to be aware of. While trying to uh, chop at a deeper plane I am unable to place the second instrument because of the lack of space. However, with a little bit of persistence, I could manage to place the instrument deep enough and during lateral separation, the first complete separation of the fragment could be finally achieved. I want to emulsify this free fragment now itself so that it creates more space within the bag. The settings are changed now. The quadrant is carefully emulsified at the pupillary plane. Now I am injecting dispersive OVD underneath which I am injecting uh, hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose. The HPMC is less thermogenic so I always prefer to put it in the bag and around the pupil whereas the dispersive OVD is much anterior nearer the cornea. I am using my chopper to cut the few connections of the posterior plate of the fragment and once it is freed I begin emulsifying the fragment. 
Kindly note that the plane at which it is being emulsified, we can see that part of the fragment is brushing around the excess margin, confirming the posterior plane of emulsification. The chopper on top of it ensures that none of the fragments move above to hit the endothelium. Well, there is one such rare fragment which escapes out but is quickly emulsified. Okay, now uh, the first piece is emulsified and we need continue to chop the remaining heminucleus. The remaining part of the heminucleus is again chopped into smaller fragments. Again, the technique of progressive chopping and lateral separation to deeper plane is carried out. And all these fragments are then very patiently and slowly emulsified under great control. Again, it's time to replenish the OVD. First, the dispersive goes in followed by HPMC underneath it. It is a sort of a modified soft shell technique. Uh, now I'm performing the horizontal chop using a blunt chopper. The posterior plate separation is difficult. Instead of struggling with the lateral separation, I go ahead and fake with that part of the attached posterior plate. This is possible since the bag is relatively empty and we have access to the posterior plate and by manipulating it anteriorly, uh, the areas which are attached are emulsified, thus freeing up the fragments. These fragments are then consumed in a very controlled manner. Even during the last fragment removal, please note that the majority of the nuclear fragment is still in the bag behind the iris during emulsification, confirming the posterior plane of emulsification. My chopper is just above the phaco tip so as to uh, prevent any fragment from flying around and hitting the endothelium. The only trick to have such control during emulsification of the fragments is to go slow and this is achieved by using lesser energy. By doing so, we will be minimizing lens chatter and turbulence. The amount of energy delivered is being controlled by the foot pedal. The only price we are paying here for such control is time. For example, this case took almost 3 times the time which I would take for a routine case. If we think from the other point of view, we can emulsify all these fragments in a fraction of few seconds, literally destroying them by just increasing the power. But the consequences would be higher amount of lens chatter and turbulence which will result in mechanical trauma to the endothelium and postoperative coronal edema. So that's the price which you are paying. So by going slow, uh, most of the things are under control. Uh, okay, the final last fragment is out. And just have a quick look at the CDE, that is the cumulative dissipated energy which is used. It's very high. It's almost uh, 10 times more than my routine soft cataract cases. So let us see how much impact does it have on the corneal endothelium in the post-op pictures. The lens is implanted and the case is done. Now is the time for the results. The next day, well, the patient is quite happy and so am I. The cornea is clear and smiling at us uh, with minimal antechamber inflammation. So there are few learnings from this case. The first common myth that increased energy consumption is deleterious to the endothelium and causes endothelial damage, it doesn't, is not entirely true. Ultrasound energy alone is not responsible for endothelial damage. You can see that in spite of uh, such a high amount of energy which was consumed during the procedure, the cornea was still crystal clear. The more important factors here would be 
controlled emulsification of the fragments with very little chatter and turbulence. These principles are far more critical in minimizing the mechanical trauma to the endothelium. And if there is very less lens chatter and turbulence, then we are confident and we can work at a much more posterior plane, which again minimizes the mechanical trauma to the endothelium and also the exposure of the energy, ultrasound energy to the endothelium is little bit far away. So again, you can you are minimizing the amount of ultrasound energy which is exposed to the endothelium. Of course, frequent and multiple shots of uh, OVD are extremely critical and they do protect the endothelium. Above all of them, patience is the greatest virtue to have in such cases. By following these principles, we can achieve clear corneas on post-op day one, even in these rock hard cataracts. Given a second chance, apart from having a slightly bigger rexis, the other thing which I would have done differently would be to create a tip which is much more deeper than what I had created in this case. I would go rather 90% depth so that the initial cracking maneuver would be more efficient and less stressful in the rexis and the zonules. That's it. Hope you found this helpful and thank you for attention.